Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you for your holy word. For in your word, we see truth. Lord, your word is truth. We praise you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture so familiar to so many and yet so understood by so many. We pray, Lord, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will open our eyes to the truths that are contained in this passage. It would help us, Lord, to see the requirements of your law. Help us, Lord, to see our complete and utter inability to obey your law. And help us, Lord, to turn to Jesus Christ in repentance and in faith, walking in obedience to the strength that received by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, people like good stories. And it often doesn't matter whether the stories are true or not. And often the most entertaining stories are actually fictional. Like Mark Twain once said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But of course, as Christians, we know that the story that has ever been recorded is the 100% true events of redemption history as we read in Holy Scripture. But in the Bible, there are many stories that are actually fictional. But before you come up here and drag me out of the pulpit, let me explain what I mean. Please don't take my statement out of context. Don't misunderstand me. Within the Gospels, we see that Jesus repeatedly tells fictional stories. Jesus is the master storyteller. It makes sense. It makes sense. Jesus is the master at everything except sin. But Jesus doesn't use his stories in this case, his parables to entertain. He uses them to teach. He uses them to teach. The word parable means comparison, or literally a throwing beside. And we touched on this briefly back in Luke chapter 5, where parables are essentially brief, illustrative messages using elements that would be familiar. They're evocative to the minds of the hearers. Now, Luke is going to focus a great deal on the parables of Jesus, especially in this middle section of Luke's gospel account, as, as Jesus has now set his face towards Jerusalem. There are uh, 18 parables that are unique to Luke in this gospel account. And the mass, vast majority of the parables that are in Luke's gospel account are found here in this section. But there are other parables that are briefer. Especially when we think of the ones like those recorded in, in Matthew. The, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden, hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. And, and then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. That also is a parable. Well, using the term parable, but in the, in the more narrow sense, in the sense of an illustrative story, and these are the ones that we see here in most of the ones we see here in, in Luke in this middle section, take place again as Jesus is journeying, journeying towards Jerusalem from the, the, almost the end of Luke 9 to almost the end of Luke 19. Again, 18 of these parables are unique to Luke, and, and many of them are, are very familiar to us. Many of them are, 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 quite, are quite popular even in the, the broader church. Well, this one, the, the one that is so-called parable of the Good Samaritan is probably up there with the parable of the prodigal son as one of the best known of Jesus' parables. But this one, the one that we're going to be looking at this morning from Luke chapter 10, 35 to 37, although it's one of the best known, it is probably also one of the most poorly understood. When you read when you read sermons about the, about the Good Samaritan or when you read commentaries, and some of the, especially some of the older commentaries, allegorical interpretations abound. And, and allegory is essentially taking every single detail and making it, a, a, and teaching that it means some, there's some hidden spiritual meaning. 
One infamous example interprets the man as representing Adam, and the thieves, the devil, and his angels who beat the man, stripping him of his immortality. And the priest and the Levite, well, they're kind of accurate here, represent the priesthood, but they expand it to, to interpret this as the whole Old Testament, the ministry of which cannot save. The Samaritan represents Jesus, the inn represents the church, the innkeeper, the apostle Paul, and so on. You, you get the point here. Such fanciful allegories rob the word of God from their intended meaning. As C.H. Dodd explains, the typical parable presents one single point of comparison. The details are not intended to have independent significance. There aren't all kinds of hidden meanings in the parables. There is one clear meaning, and that is certainly the case here in the so-called parable of the Good Samaritan. But it's not just allegorical interpretations that rob this parable of its intended meaning. This parable is often misinterpreted and misapplied. The, the term good Samaritan is part of common parlance. We, we use this word quite often as a, as a compliment to somebody who does extraordinary good deeds, who really goes out of their way to help others. We call them a good Samaritan. Some would suggest that this parable is about tearing down walls between enemies. Well, it's the right principle, but from the wrong passage. There's plenty of other passages that talk about, about the gospel tearing down walls between enemies, but not this one. Others suggest that this parable is to, is to strive towards social justice. Well, these Interpretations and many others like it are actually putting the, the proverbial cart before the horse. Forgetting that these things are a fruit of the gospel. This is, we don't focus and make these things central, but they are the result of who we are in Christ. Many organizations have modeled themselves after these faulty understandings of this parable. Everything from affordable housing initiatives to international crisis relief, to aged care facilities, and even RV clubs name themselves after the Good Samaritan. But many of these miss, completely miss the point of this parable and miss the point of the gospel. Jesus is not saying, be like this Samaritan. And really, this parable shouldn't actually be even titled the Good Samaritan. Now this passage is about love. And it's true, like my title says, you can't love by yourself. But in choosing that title, I chose to be deliberately ambiguous. I wanted to make a point. Jesus is not teaching here that you cannot love if you shut yourself off from everyone else. If you, cannot, if you shut yourself off from the rest of the world. Though again, it's true. Rather, Jesus is teaching here that your love is not good enough. You will never love as God's moral command requires. Your love is not good enough, period. You can never love the way God commands. In fact, you can widen the application so you can never do anything. as well as God commands them to be done. You cannot do anything in order to be saved. Now this passage before us is, is really breaks down into, into two points, really bound, grounded on, on two questions. And both of these questions are asked by a scribe, one who has actually set himself in opposition against Jesus. So the two questions, verse, in verse 25, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And we'll look at that from from verses 25 to 28. And the second question, verse 29, who is my neighbor? We'll look at that from verses 29 to 37. Now these two questions are really integrally related. In fact, as commentator Joel Green points out, that, that when, you, when you look at the structure of this passage, you can actually see that the same outline is actually repeated. And so Luke is, is really, and, and I marvel at, at Luke's ability here, that, and that he talks about writing a, a, 
a, an orderly account. Well, here you can see again just how orderly his account is. As he weaves together Jesus' parable and the events that lead up to it and, and, and afterwards that, that, that reveal Jesus' teaching on this subject. So it, we'll see the first part and the second part, the, the identification of the lawyer's motive. Then we'll see the lawyer's question. Then we'll see Jesus' answer with a question. Then we'll see the lawyer's correct response and then Jesus' command. You'll see that in, in the first part and in the second part. So the first question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Verses 25 to 28. Now right away we meet the lawyer. Now this lawyer it was not a, a lawyer as we commonly think of lawyers. He was a religious lawyer. He was a teacher of the law, an expert of the law. But as a lawyer in that context, he was also an expert on the Mishnah. The extra-biblical, man-made teachings of rabbinic Judaism that added 613 other laws to the law of God. And this rabbinic Judaism promoted legalism, it promoted Phariseeism and self-righteousness. We don't have to wait very long to find out where this lawyer is at. Luke provides us here with an editorial comment exposing the lawyer's motive. He's helping us to see what Jesus saw and heard in the question from the Lord. Now, sometimes you can, you can get a clue about, about what somebody means when they ask you something by their tone of voice, by the expression of their face, but Jesus knew what was going on in this man's heart. And so Luke tells us that this lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. This man is trying to entrap Jesus. He, he's trying to, to build a case against Jesus. He's trying to get Jesus to say something that his enemies could later use against him. Remember that this, that this event, this, 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 this description of this discussion took, took place as Jesus was on his way towards Jerusalem where, where all of this, this hostility between, between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees and the um, and the Levites and the whole Jewish religious system is going to come to a head as Jesus is brought before their courts. It's going to culminate in his crucifixion. So here we see the lawyer's motive. He has set himself against Jesus. Well, next we see the lawyer's question. He asks, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In asking this question to, to test Jesus, he had unwittingly stumbled upon an extremely important question. It's a question which we all must answer. But this lawyer didn't just stumble upon the question. He will stumble, stumble over the answer as well, as we will see. Just think about what's happening here. This lawyer is challenging the incarnate word about the inerrant word. This lawyer is, is challenging the word of God about the word of God. It's a fool's errand. But in a bitter irony, he'd actually come to the right person. If he really wanted to know the answer to this, he's asking the right person. He's coming to the one who could not only answer the question, but the one who is, who is the answer to the question. Now, I'm, I'm sure you've had these kinds of conversations where, where a person asks you something, but, but again, you don't have insight into their heart, but, but it's pretty obvious in their tone of voice and the, the context of the conversation, and, and the, the, you can see that they really don't want to find out what you believe. Let alone, they, they really don't want to hear the gospel. But they want to corner you. They want to trap you in your words. But as with this question, quite often these people aren't, aren't doing this. You need to see the, the heart behind it. When, when someone challenges you like that about your faith, it's not that they just want to have a debate with you. That's not really what they're looking for. 
It's, it's not because they, they really feel like they're coming to you from a, a superior moral position. It's because they feel challenged about their moral position. It's because they're uncomfortable with the gospel truths, with the, with the claims that, that Jesus makes uh, about him being the, the only way and the only truth and the only life and the only way to the Father and, and to realize that, that every other way is a way that leads to death. And that truth is, is written on the hearts of every human being. Now people do everything that they can to try to, to silence that voice. I tried using immorality and drugs and alcohol for many years, but it didn't. It just, by compounding my sin, it just made the voice louder. Again, as I say so often, there is no such thing as an atheist, only anti-theists. So this lawyer feels uncomfortable with Jesus and uncomfortable with his teaching. So he asks what he can do to inherit eternal life. Well, the reality is he can't do anything. He can't do anything. He is trying to earn eternal life. He thinks that salvation is by the works of the law. So as it turns out, this, this expert of the law doesn't really know the standards of the law or the application of the law. Again, people do this sort of thing all the time when you, when you try to share the gospel with them. They say, I'm a good person. And they rhyme off several good things that they have done. They see themselves as, as the good Samaritan. They, they think that, that they are the hero of their story. Well, now we see in verse 26 how Jesus answers the lawyer's question with a question. I think he answers the question with a question. Make note of that. If somebody asks you an awkward question, you're not obligated to answer that question. Sometimes it's better, as Jesus so often does, to answer their question with a question. And so Jesus answers this lawyer with, he answers this question with a question, really two questions. What is written in the law and how do you read it? Now, Jesus is, is revealing his profound wisdom here. He, he is appealing to the law, and in so doing, reveals his faithfulness to the law, despite the fact he's often accused of being a lawbreaker. He's also appealing to what appears, at least, to be a common authority between him and this lawyer, the Word of God. So, in fact, Jesus is pointing this lawyer back to the law that he's supposed to be an expert in. What does the law say? What do you say? And those two answers had better line up. Well, now we see in verse 27, the lawyer's correct response. The lawyer's correct response. He's combining the law to the command to love God from Deuteronomy 5, which is part of the Shema, which for Jews is the most important passage in the scriptures. And the command to love your neighbor from Levit Leviticus 19.18. And, and together, these, these two verses are really the summation of God's moral law. Love God and love your neighbor. And, and these really encapsulate the, the two tables of the Ten, Ten Commandments. Elsewhere in the Gospels, they are called the Great Commandment, the Royal Law, and the Law of Love. Now let's deal with the, the first part of this command, the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. The whole person is described here, right? Emotion, consciousness, will, and intellect. And the second is like it. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. Now this isn't multiple choice. The only correct answer here is, is E, all of the above. You must do it all. And you must do it all the time. If you really want to earn your salvation, you must love God perfectly, and you must love your neighbor perfectly. And you must never shirk your 
commitment to that commandment in any moment. Because if you want to earn your righteousness by your works, just breaking one point of the law, as we saw from, from James chapter 2, just breaking one point of the law makes you a lawbreaker. And because of, of the infinite holiness of God requires the infinite punishment for the lawbreaker in hell. So the command to love God and the command to love neighbor really are a summary of the moral law of God. And your love for others is integrally linked to your love for God. In fact, your love for others flows from your love for God. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For you do not love his brother whom he has not seen, cannot love, sorry, who he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So now Jesus tells the lawyer, you have answered correctly. You have answered correctly. And so we, here we see Jesus' command. Do this and you will live. Jesus is acknowledging here that if you really, again, love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbors yourself, you will receive eternal life. Obey the law and live eternally. And that's exactly what the lawyer's religion was grounded upon. Obey the law, which, which again for them meant the, the moral law of God and also the, 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 the 613 man-made laws of the Mishnah. Obey all of that and live. It's a workspace religion. In fact, every single religion on the planet is a works-based religion. You have the, the, the uh, five sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church or the five pillars of Islam or the eightfold path of Buddhism. It's all works-based. It's all earning your way to heaven or whatever they describe heaven to be. People today, not just, just Jews, not just Jews, do the same thing. When you, you try to tell them the gospel, again, they'll say, I'm a good person. I keep the good commandments. I keep most of them. Most of the time, God will accept me. But I've seen a trend increasing in our anti-Christian culture. As they appeal to the, the 21st century Ten Commandments. You shall accept all gods, except the God of the Bible. You shall worship the planet. You, not, you shall not say anything to anyone except Christians that they might find offensive. Remember that the Sabbath is just like every other day of the week. Rebel against your father and mother when you're young, and when they're old, shove them in an old, old age care home and forget about them. You shall not kill animals. Killing people is okay as long as it's for entertainment purposes in movies and games. You shall embrace whatever expression of sexuality you, you want and celebrate others doing the same. You shall not steal from the planet. Refer to Second Commandment. You shall not bear gospel witness to anyone. You shall not covet. Just buy whatever you want using your credit card, using Amazon two-day delivery. That, these are the commandments that, that people live by in our day. Our culture says, do this and live. Don't do this and you'll be canceled. That's our culture. But now this lawyer would have repudiated all of that. His moral compass as he thought was calibrated to God's law. And Jesus affirms that, that, that the lawyer's moral standard is actually biblical. He says, you have answered correctly. But Jesus' response personalizes the command. This command is, is not just an, an abstract, impersonal decree. He's saying to this lawyer, you do this. 
and you will live. In other words, if, if you want to go to heaven, love perfectly. But the problem is, he hasn't. And neither of you. Have you loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Have you loved your neighbor as yourself? Have you done that in the last five minutes? Have you done that ever? And what about the many, 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 many times, as in all the time, you haven't? Now the lawyer knows that he hasn't. He, he's like a deer in the headlights. He, he's like an accused criminal in, in a court of law when, when new damning evidence comes to light. And this is damning evidence indeed. So now the lawyer asks a second question in response to Jesus' question. The lawyer says he's backed himself into a corner and he knows it. So he asks, who is my neighbor? Verse 29, and I'm going to expand this to, to Jesus' answer in verse 37, all the way to verse 37. Again, Luke gives us an editorial comment. And notice how the, the progression follows the same outline as we saw in the first section, the first half of the passage. First, he exposes the lawyer's, Luke tells us, the lawyer's motive. Again, Luke is telling us what Jesus knew. This lawyer knew that his unrighteousness was exposed by Jesus' question, so he desires to justify himself. I've heard it said that a, the man who represents himself in a court of law has a fool for a client. Now that statement might come from the, the bar association and the desire to, to drum up business, but at least in this case, it's true. You will never justify yourself in God's court. You need an advocate who is far, 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 far better than you. Now, in many respects, this event is similar to another individual who sought to justify himself before Jesus. We'll, we'll be talking about him when we finally get to Luke 18, the rich young ruler. And in that situation, Jesus revealed that this rich young ruler, in refusing to, to sell what he has and to follow Jesus, that he hasn't really loved God, that he has not kept the first commandment. But this time, Jesus reveals that this lawyer hasn't kept the Sixth Commandment, that, 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 he, had, he, that he was not loving his neighbor, and that his, his attempts to self-justify are the common response when an unrepentant sinner's guilt is exposed. The unrepentant sinner wants to escape the feelings of guilt, so they, they try to convince themselves but they haven't been as bad as it seemed. That they have some excuse. Or that the standard of, of morality is, is not as high as it seems. Now this lawyer tries the last one. He, he tries to diminish the command so that he isn't obligated to obey. Again, we see a parallel with the first half of this passage. The, the lawyer's question. He responds with a question. Who is my neighbor? Now, he should have simply acknowledged his guilt and asked for forgiveness, but instead he sought to justify himself. Now, he should have known what the requirement of the law is because neighbor love is clearly taught in the Old Testament. There are commands about, lo of lo about loving the sojourner as you love yourself from Leviticus 19.34. There are commands about loving your enemy, like in Exodus 24, uh, 23, 4 and 5, that speak of, of helping your enemy by rescuing his animal. And an expert in the law should have known that. But the Jews, instead of, instead of loving their neighbor, they went to the other extreme. They went to the extreme of avoiding their neighbors altogether, isolating themselves from their neighbor. And Paul is going to indict 
the Jews for their disdain of the law, for this very thing in Romans 2, verses 23 to 29. Verse 23, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. And this lawyer is, is asking here about the least amount of, obe of obedience that is required. But Jesus re requires perfect obedience. The lawyer hopes that Jesus is going to reduce the ethical requirements, but Jesus doesn't. Rather, he shows, Jesus shows that love is far more demanding than the lawyer realizes. Jesus is, is about to reveal who the lawyer should have considered as his neighbor. But now we see again that Jesus answers a question with a question. Jesus answers the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor, with another question. This question comes down in verse 36. But in order to, to get to the question, Jesus tells this parable, this fictional story with a vital lesson. Jesus is going to expose the lawyer's self-righteousness as a fiction to reveal that this man hasn't come anywhere close to loving his neighbor as himself. And also revealing that his lack of love for his neighbor is also going to reveal his, la his love for God as a fiction as well. So Jesus begins this parable with a man. Jesus doesn't provide any details about the man's identity or his nationality. The, the man's identity is not important to this parable. This man could be anybody. This man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. This was, was a notorious route, sometimes referred to as the bloody way. It was a 30 kilometer, or less than 30 kilometer stretch of road that, that went from an ascent, uh, descended from 800 meters above sea level to about 200 meters below sea level. And this road wound through barren, rocky terrain that was surrounded by caves. These, these caves were, were perfect hideouts for robbers from which they could ambush travelers. And that's what happens in this parable, that, that robbers assault this traveler. They strip him and beat him almost to death and flee. Now we're told by chance, a priest was going past on his way home to Jericho where, and Jericho at that time was, was actually a, a, the location where a lot of, uh, there were quite a number of, of priests and Levites who dwelt there and they would travel back and forth along that road to Jericho. And this priest sees the man lying there. Good news. Here's a priest, God's servant, a, a paragon of virtue. He's just been ministering in the temple. Surely he is going to help this poor hapless traveler. Nope. The priest actually crosses to the other side of the road, get as physically far away from this, this poor man as he could in order to pass him by. And we're not told exactly why he passed by. It could have been possibly because of, of ceremonial uncleanness, that, be, that he could have thought this man was dead and that, that in touching a, a dead body he would become ceremonially unclean. But I don't think that's actually likely here because, remember, he was on his way back to Jericho, so his temple duties would have been fulfilled. And furthermore, priests, according to rabbinic law, priests were also required to bury a neglected corpse. But either way, that wouldn't have been a legitimate excuse. Maybe he was scared that the robbers would return. Maybe he felt he was too busy. We just don't know. But again, that's not the point of the parable. We do know that the priest left the man in his suffering. He left him to die. And he got away as quickly and as far away as he could. Well, next the Levite comes. The Levites were dedicated to temple service. They were considered to be the assistants to the priests. So maybe he, uh, another servant of God, another virtuous man, maybe he's going to help this poor traveler. Nope. He's going to do exactly what the priest did. He's going to cross by on the other side of the road and, and get away as quickly and as far away as he possibly can. Well, just think for a second about how this lawyer would have felt right about now. 
here we have the leaders in his religion making his religion look pretty bad. And the question remains, who will love this dying man? Well, the, or, the lawyer and others listening probably would have expected Jesus to say that a lay person came next. That this parable was, was denouncing the religious establishment. But Jesus was actually doing a whole lot more. It is going to be a sharp critique of the religious establishment. But it's going to be a sharp critique of the whole system of works-based righteousness. The lawyer and anyone else with an earshot would have not have expected who would next come down the road in Jesus' parable. In a dramatic plot twist, a Samaritan appears next. A social and religious outcast. Now we've spoken before about the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. The, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. The Jews, for their part, viewed the Samaritans as idolatrous mongrels. In 848, the, the worst insult that the Jews could, could think of to level against Jesus is that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon. That's the worst insult that they could think of. But the Samaritans didn't feel any better about the Jews. We, and so the, 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 the lawyer would not have expected, would never have expected a Samaritan to be the one to help. Now likely the disciples wouldn't have expected it either. As they heard this this parable because of what had recently happened, remember, in the Samaritan village where the Samaritans had rejected Jesus as he'd wanted to, to pass through their village and minister to them. They'd re rejected Jesus and the disciples, remember, James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven against them. Well, nonetheless, in this parable, it is the Samaritan who has compassion on this poor traveler. His compassion and, and his obedience to the command to love your neighbor is in sharp contrast to the disobedience of the priest and the Levite. I'd like to have seen the look on that lawyer's face when Jesus said, Samaritan. Well, put yourself in that lawyer's position. I had to consider this for myself. What if instead of a Samaritan, the Lord put somebody there who has treated you poorly? Or someone that you look down on? And said, Jesus said it was that person who helped the traveler. What would have been the look on your face? Jesus is exposing the lawyer's hatred. He's exposing yours too. Jesus is showing that neighbors are found everywhere, among any ethnic group, any religious group, and any group at all. Neighbors are even those that you consider enemies. And there's a lesson here for that lawyer, but again, it's also a lesson for, the other, for those disciples and also a lesson for us. So then in verses 33 to 35, Jesus goes into detail describing the Samaritans' care for the man. And with every step, this, this Samaritan is distancing himself from the religious Jews, from the priest and the Levite. Instead of disregarding the traveler, the Samaritan has compassion on him. Instead of crossing by on the other side of the road, the Samaritan went to him. Instead of failing the man, the Samaritan helped him. And the Samaritan helped this traveler in exemplary ways. He applies oil to soothe the wounds and wine as an antiseptic. And the Samaritan bandaged the, the man with, with what must have been some of his own clothing, his own material, because remember, this, this man had been left stripped. The Samaritan put the man on his own animal. And for a Jew, that would have meant that this, the animal was now unclean. The Samaritan took a man to an inn. And even once he got to the inn, he continued to help the man. 
provided for the man out of his own funds. And when he had to leave, he gave the innkeeper two denarii, which is, would have been enough to provide for the man's care for at least three weeks. In fact, the, the Samaritan told the innkeeper that, that if there was any extra, he would pay that too. He wrote a blank check. Say, whatever this man needs, I want to foot the bill for. That's selfless love. That's selfless love. Love is not merely a, a warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is an action. Love is a verb. 1 John 3.18 Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Or James 2 that Ross read for us earlier. James 2, 16 and 17. The one who says to the needy, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving the, the, uh, what is needed for the body. What good is that? Faith without works is dead. It's not real faith. Well, now finally in verse 36, we get to the question that is the point of Jesus' parable. Remember, Jesus is answering the lawyer's question with a question. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Notice that Jesus reframes the question. It's not who is my neighbor, but who proved to be a neighbor. Who has proved himself to be a real neighbor? Obviously, the Samaritan. The priest and the Levite didn't even know who their neighbor was. They didn't keep the law. Jesus is saying to the lawyer, neither have you. You haven't kept the law either. You don't even know who your neighbor is, let alone how to love him, let alone how to fulfill the command to love him. And friends, neither of you, neither have I. We have never done this, ever. And you might be thinking, yeah, I would have helped that poor man on the road. Sure, I would have foot the bill. I would have done that. Well, maybe you would have. But there are countless other ways that you have not loved your neighbor according to God's standards every single day. Jesus' question exposes the lack of love in the lawyer and the lack of love in you and in me. So the lawyer reluctantly responds to Jesus' question in verse 37. The one who showed him mercy. Now this lawyer is further exposing his heart. He can't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. And so we close with Jesus' command. You go and do likewise. You are called to do the same. You are called to love not just ourselves, not just yourself, not just your family and your friends, not just others like you, your neighbors. And so who is your neighbor? Everyone. Everyone is your neighbor. The whole human race is your neighbor. Whatever someone's beliefs, whatever someone's background or circumstances, every human being on the planet is your neighbor. Your Muslim neighbor is your neighbor. Your immoral neighbor is your neighbor. Your drug-addicted neighbor is your neighbor. Your liberal neighbor is your neighbor. And any of them can respond to God by His grace. You need to share God's grace with them by telling them about God's grace. Your neighbor is also that needy child halfway around the world. Your neighbor is that baby in the womb who's about to be aborted. Your neighbor, your neighbor is that young girl, a victim of human trafficking. Your neighbor is that woman on that website. And how can you help them? You may never meet them, but you can pray for them. You may never meet them, but you can look for practical ways to help them. But your failure to love reveals your need for a savior. Even as Christians, 
our failure to love proves the fact that we still need a Savior. You cannot love by yourself. You need God's forgiveness for your failure, and you need God's strength to love. Those who are saved are commanded to love. The command to love is real. The command to love is eternal. You must love, but just because you won't measure up doesn't mean that you can give up. Christian, strive through the strength that God provides to love. Those who have inherited eternal life will grow in their love for God. They will grow in their love for their neighbor. But again, you can't do it by yourself. You, but you will begin to love your neighbor as, as yourself by God's strength through the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling you as a believer. So Jesus says, go and do like the Samaritan. But the Samaritan isn't the point of the story. Yes, the Samaritan came closer than the lawyer, but the Samaritan isn't the standard. The Samaritan isn't good. The good Samaritan doesn't exist. Now, I'm not saying there are no good Samaritans. I'm saying there are no good people. There are no good people. No one is good except God alone. Luke 18, 19. Now, earlier I said that every religion is works-based. You understand that Christianity is works-based as well, don't you? But in Christianity, Jesus Christ did all the work. Jesus Christ did all the work. You can't do anything to inherit eternal life. In fact, even the choice, the, Samar- the uh, lawyer's choice of the word inherit is telling. In order for you to inherit money from a, from a relative, what do you have to do? Nothing. What does the relative have to do? Die. You can't do anything to inherit eternal life. Eternal life is the gift of God by His grace. For those who who through the power of the Holy Spirit turn from their sin and place their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. This parable is meant to point the lawyer and us to Jesus, to the only one who can love perfectly, to the only one who has truly kept the moral love, law of God, to the only one who has loved the Lord as God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, to the only one who's ever loved his neighbor as himself. And Jesus did it all the time, perfectly. So this parable is meant to destroy self-righteousness and reveal the need that we all have to trust in Jesus Christ, that by faith, his perfect righteousness is credited to your account. And to trust that by faith, your sin was placed upon him as he died in your place. Now, if you could do this, if you could love God perfectly, if you could love your neighbor perfectly, you would earn salvation. But you know you can't. You know that you cannot obey God's law. But the law is not the problem. You are the problem. I am the problem. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 19.8. In Paul's autobiographical self-testimony in Romans 7, he says in verse 12, So the the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. And in verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. And Paul concludes Romans 7 with this question. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? As we think about Reformation Day having just passed yesterday, this was the question that was asked by Martin Luther, a Roman monk. 
who strived for righteousness, who who strived to honor God with his life, but he realized that he fell woefully short of of God's commands. And so he he wondered, "How, how can I ever be righteous? And then in God's providence, he stumbled across the words of Roman 1, Romans 1, 16 and 17, the, the, the verses that sparked the Protestant Reformation. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by by faith. Luther's conclusion is the same as Paul's conclusion in Romans 24 and 25. Thanks be to God who through Jesus Christ our Lord so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. When you consider that in the wider context that the Apostle Paul says we are no longer slaves of sin because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We, we are set free from bondage to sin and we have now become slaves to righteousness. So in the outworking of the gospel in our lives, we grow. We grow in love for God. We grow in love for our neighbor as part of our progressive sanctification. Realizing that that you will never, even on your best day, even if you were to live a thousand lifetimes of progressive sanctification, you will never arrive at the righteous standard that God requires of you. But you and I, brothers and sisters, we look by faith at the one who did, and at the one who died in your place and mine, and the one who lived in your place and mine. Our Lord Jesus Christ, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you for who you are. We praise you, Lord, for your great grace. We praise you, Lord, for living the life that we have never lived. We praise you, Lord, for dying the death that we deserve to die. We praise you, Lord, that you have revealed your holy commands to us. That shows us how you would have us live. That shows us how we fall woefully short of that standard. And yet, Lord, we also see from your word that you died in our place. And that the righteous requirement of the law was fulfilled by you for us. Help us, Lord, we pray, by your grace and for your glory, to look to you in faith and confidence that we have been credited, credited with your righteousness. And then help us, we pray, as your people were called by your name, Lord, to by your grace and for your glory, to walk in obedience. Help us, Lord, to love you. Help us, Lord, to see who our neighbor really is and help us, Lord, to love our neighbor for your glory and for the building of your church. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.